Check, check. Check, check, check. Everyone, welcome to Monday night. If you want to come take your seats. We're going to start in about 30 seconds here, guys. Okay, Shh. man, it works every time. It's so weird. It doesn't work in Europe, but it works for Americans. You respond to the shh. It's kind of strange. How's everyone tonight? If it's your first time at Monday night, can you raise your hands? Oh, nice. If you're, if you're a circuit rider staff, hey, if you're a circuit rider staff and you just got back, for staff training week, can you give us a little shout out in here? Well guys, welcome to Monday night. If you don't know Circuit Riders, we host this gathering every Monday night for university students, for high schoolers. And our goal with this shh, shh, our goal with these gatherings is to host Jesus and his presence, to exalt the Bible, and to be a launching pad and ascending place so that you would not live a normal Christian life, but it would be radical and different from what you're presently experiencing in most places. Amen? How many of you say that's a little bit of a, that, that is kind of what has happened to you since you've come to Monday nights, your life's changed just a tad? <laughs> your life's been changed, Dylan, that's good. Can you guys stand with me? We're going to jump into worship here. Okay, I want to read you this verse. It's Acts chapter 13, verse 2 and 3. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Paul and Barnabas, the two greatest missionaries starting the modern day and church missions movement, were initiated in this cause in a worship time. Not in like a staff meeting, not in a Bible time by themselves, but in, in worship and prayer, they were set apart for the work of the ministry for missions. Every time I come in this room on a Monday night, I have no clue what to expect. Some of you in this room could have come in here with struggling with the same sin issues for the last 15 years of your life, and the t tonight could be the moment where you actually get set free. You also could be in rebellion against Jesus Christ and his calling over your life, and tonight could be the night where you say yes to it. I have no clue what could have happened, but all I know is if Jesus is in here, then we must honor him and we must give him the highest place and the utmost respect. So would you guys lift your hands with me in this place? Lord, tonight... We don't come to Monday nights to have an experience with anyone other than you. Not with circuit riders or Lindy or the worship team or a preacher. We want to know you, we want to experience you, and we want you to transform us. Lord, so tonight, send your Holy Spirit. Encounter us in power in the name of Jesus. can just for a few moments just lift your hands all across this room just let Jesus hear your voice tonight lift up your own song to Jesus tonight oh lift up your voice tonight
you emptied my grave. It's just what you've done. I can't help but sing now, cause you emptied my grave. You're the only God who could save me in the darkest night. You were the only God. give the Lord a hand tonight. God, we praise you. Oh, we praise your name. We sing blessing and honor and glory and power forever and ever in blessing to just worship you, Jesus.
rise from your heart. Let praise rise from your heart to the throne of God tonight. Oh, Jesus, we say you're worthy. God, would you just allow his spirit of worship to take us over tonight? I feel like there's something beautiful. You know, if you've been coming to Monday nights, a few, uh, like six or seven weeks ago, we did John 4 about how we are the dwelling place of God now. And it's so funny. I just always pay attention. They've replaced the batteries in my in-ears up here like four times. If you see the people running on the stage, that's what's happening. 
And then I just felt the Lord say, no, 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 just get consumed in worship. Just stop worrying about it. So that's what I wanna do tonight. We don't come here to just sing a song. We all know that. You're in this room because you don't come here to sing a song, you know? So I just wanna do something a little bit different right now. We're gonna do a song called Christ and Christ Crucified, but before we go into it, I just want the band to play. I just wanna let a love song rise from this place to the heart of God. So all across this room, I'm gonna ask the Holy Spirit that if you've never encountered the love of God tonight, that he would meet you with his love. Because the Bible says there's no greater love than this, than one who lays down his life for his friends. And we come to worship Jesus simply because he's worthy, but he's so kind. And I felt like maybe there was a few people tonight that you came hungry saying, I wanna meet the love of God. So as Isaac plays, I just want you to begin to sing a love song to Jesus. You may not even have done that ever before, but it can look something like this. Thank you for saving me, for taking my depression, for healing me, Jesus. Or a love song can just start so simple like this. And I love you, I love you. So just all across the room, just begin to lift your voice to Jesus.
of you know someone who's not a Christian? Good. Um, just for the next 30 seconds, can you partner up with a person next to, to you and just think of that one person in your school or at your university or the person you saw on the street, family member, and just pray for the Lord to save them and to move on their heart and that his gospel would penetrate their hearts and save them. Lord, we just pray right now all across this room for salvation, for salvation in Los Angeles, on Skid Row, and the prostitute, and the sinner, and the gang member, Lord. We pray for salvation for the sinner in Southern California in Jesus' name. We pray for our family members Lord, we bless your name. Lord, we bless your name. Lord, we bless your name. Exalt Jesus Christ in Los Angeles. Exalt Jesus Christ in Orange County. Exalt Jesus on our universities and on our high schools. In Jesus' name, in our families, in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys can have your seats. Find your seats, guys, find your seats. Thank you, homie. Okay, guys, once again, welcome to Monday night. We're so glad you're here. If you do not know my name, it's Derek Mack. If you don't know what Circuit Riders is, Circuit Riders is a movement from YWAM to universities and high schools to empower young people like yourselves to reach their generation for Jesus. And we have a deep, deep burden for our generation. It wouldn't take uh, a brainiac to figure out that what's going on in the world right now is abnormal over the last hundred years and that something really uh, dramatic is happening. There's a cultural seismic shift that's happening right now and you're on the planet for it. I mean, you could have been born a hundred years ago when everything was just kind of normal. I don't know what it was like a hundred years ago, just after World War I, I guess. I, I don't know what it was like then, but right now we have some pretty dramatic things going on and you're on this earth. Do you ever think about that for a second? Like, think about Esther. When Mordecai comes to Esther and says to her, your people are gonna perish if you don't do something. You were born for such a time as this, Esther. And Esther says, if I perish, I perish. If I perish, I perish. Would there be some people in this room that would say that same thing and have that same DNA and that same culture? And the reason I say culture is because our subject tonight is faith. And faith as a culture is something we hold very near and dear to our hearts. Um, many of you circuit riders have had the culture, heard the culture of faith, but we want everybody to understand these three things. 
God can, God does, and God will. God can, God does, God will. If you remember anything from tonight, God can, God does, God will. Okay, two quick announcements. We have summer schools this summer. For university students, we have one in Orange County. We have one in Dallas, Texas, July 3rd through the 12th and July 17th through the 27th. Um, Christians today, generally speaking, and this is probably, a, it's probably an overstatement, but a lot of people don't even know how to talk about Jesus. Tell them, hey, what's the gospel? And they'll say, oh, baptism, or they'll say something, tongues, praying tongues right now, watch, boom. And that's kind of how it goes. And you ask them, what's just the simple gospel? And the reason most people don't know how to do that is because they haven't been trained. We all need to be trained. Jesus, think about this, most People today would say Jesus was a failure because he only had 12 guys left over to spread the kingdom. If you were gonna start a movement, wouldn't the number one thing that you wanna do get thousands and thousands of people so that when you're gone, it keeps going? That wasn't Jesus' method. Jesus' method was take a small group of people, train them radically, and then they'll live radically. Not a bunch of People who come and sit and listen and then say, mm, that was convicting, that was good, and then go live their lives the exact same way. It wasn't Jesus' method. So get trained if you're a high schooler in this place. Raise your hand. Give me a little wave. Shout out to, shout out to the, there's got to be more than that. Shout out to the high schoolers in here. We have two, three camps for you guys. Riders, Riders Youth Camp, Orange County. Orange County, California, Dallas, Texas, and Kona. But I know none of you would want to go to none of you would want to go to Kona, Hawaii. So just forget that one, okay? Um, so get trained this summer, guys. Join us in one of those uh, three locations or two locations for universities, and we will see you guys there. Okay, is Jonathan Stamper in the room? Where is Jonathan Stamper? Where is he? Oh, he's always at the back. He's always hidden in dark corners praying to the Lord. Jonathan, come up here. Jonathan's a dear friend. We're getting to know each other be better. Stand up for Jonathan. Let's give him a little bit of a round of applause. There we go. There we go. Love you, bro. What's going on, guys? How's everybody doing? You guys doing good? Ooh. Don't do that. Don't do that. Everybody's good? See, you already know. I ain't even got to tell you at this point. Everybody stand up all across the room. All right. Sum up with this computer. Okay. Um, I feel the fear of the Lord in here. I feel like God's going to do something really, really special. Um, and so this is what I want us to do. Um, yeah, can we just all lift our hands real quick? Holy Spirit, we invite you. We honor you. We give you glory, honor, majesty, power. We ask you to invade this place with the weight of your glory. Would you reveal the Son of God to us and transform the way that we do life with you and for you and through you? In Jesus' name, amen. Now, before you take your seats, turn to your neighbor. This is what we're going to do. Just give me a little second. Get this computer back on. Something's up with it. But y'all know we do our declaration whenever I get up here and preach. So some of y'all should know by heart by this point. But turn to your neighbor. And I want you to make a statement now. Don't get familiar with this thing because it has power on it if you keep it going, okay? So make this statement to your neighbor, and I'll know how much you agree with it by how loudly you shout. Come on. There you go. You got to stir this thing up. Atmosphere's got to go to the next place. All right, you ready? You got your neighbor? All right. Say neighbor. Today is the day where everything changes. Now lift up a shout of praise all across this room. Come on. I didn't say a cute applause. I didn't say a golf clap. I said praise him. Come on. Come on, praise him all across the room. He's doing something special in this atmosphere. I can feel the Holy Spirit moving already. So I don't want to waste too much time. We're going to get into our word. Before you guys take your seats, I want you to pull up this scripture for me. It's not a long one, so it shouldn't take you very long to get there. Hebrews 10 
starting at verse 19, from verse 19 to verse 22, okay? I'm just going to read it so that we don't have to take up too much time. It goes as follows. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, I'm going to end it kind of halfway through, with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Now, the name of my sermon tonight is A Culture of Faith with the subtitle, Closing the Distance. Okay, you can take your seats. All right. Now, my boy and my brother, Nick Brent, gave me a commission tonight. I was trying to prepare this sermon in traditional culture of faith fashion, but Nick likes to challenge me, and I'm always one who's up for a challenge, especially when it comes to preaching the word. And so we're going to dive into this culture from a dimension that maybe you may not be familiar with, and if it's your first time diving into the culture of faith, I think this is going to set a good precedent for what it means, okay? And so I just want to bring you into a personal journey I've been on, and hopefully it translates to a corporate encounter, okay? I've been challenged lately. How many of you know what it's like to be challenged by the Lord or challenged by your life or challenged by your circumstances? Personally, I've been challenged, and my challenge is not necessarily just in the realm of my consecration. My challenge is not just in the realm of my um, obedience to Christ or, or my obedience to my calling. My challenge is not purely financial or social. My challenge is in the realm of possibilities. I've been challenged in the realm of possibilities. This is really, really important, so pay attention. And frankly, what I've been feeling in my heart as of late, just if I can bring you into my life, is a rebuke of sorts from the Lord. Um, and the rebuke that I've been feeling from him, if you're not familiar with that word, is kind of just like a dealing, a, a strong dealing um, that God gives you sometimes. I've been feeling this unction or rebuke from God. Simply put, that I'm not preposterous enough that I live a little too normally, that I act a little too normally. I have not accepted a way of life that is preposterous. And I feel like this challenge is not just for me. It's why I'm bringing you into it. I feel like it's a challenge for many of you in this room. In fact, I feel like it's a challenge for the body of Christ, especially in this hour that maybe we might need to get a little bit preposterous. I feel like there are ways that we live that accept normality and accept kind of a culture of acute going by. But I believe there's something about the Christian life that's supposed to be preposterous. Uh, I feel like the heart of a preposterous life is a hunger for the impossible. Come on, stay with me. Uh, there's got to be a hunger for the impossible in order for you to live a, a preposterous life. And the issue that we have, uh, especially as believers, is we don't understand that one of our chief responsibilities as Christians is a responsibility to the impossible. We have an obligation to the impossible. This is extremely important because why? Why do we have an obligation? Because impossible circumstances reveal the glory of God to the saved and unsaved alike. And if our lives are meant to be reflections of his glory, then our responsibility is to pull on impossible circumstances. Say, I hear you. I hear you. Say, I understand. I understand. Okay. I feel like we need a fresh dose of the impossible. I really, really, really do. If I'm thinking about Christian dumb as of late, there's been a lot of nice things happening, but I really feel like we don't have enough impossible circumstances and situations that we experience on a regular basis, the power of God. Do you understand what I'm saying? I really feel like a lot of what's happened is we've gotten too common with a God that we can comprehend or a God whose actions and attributes and abilities can be attributed to humankind's comprehension or humankind's capacity. But I believe that there's something that's about to enter the earth right now that's gonna be called only God can do that. Oh, you're missing it. We're already going there. I feel like there's something that's about to enter the earth called only God can do that. Only God can make somebody get out of a wheelchair. 
Only God can restore a family with generations and generations of brokenness. Only God can raise men and women back from the dead. I believe we need an impossible kind of Christianity because this generation, the Bible says, a wicked and perverse generation desires a sign and a wonder. And we've heard that as though it was a rebuke. But what I believe is when we start to enter into the realm of the impossible, what the world and everyone else says, there must be a God. Does that make sense? We've got to step into the impossible. And there's a few ways that you got to do it. But this, this kind of question of faith and, and stepping into impossibilities and realities like that is important to us as believers. Really because we're in an hour where we need faith like never before. Anybody know that we're in a time where we need faith like never before? This is really important. We as a culture, I believe we've experienced so much difficulty in these, in these days where it's just it's honestly incomprehensible. It's hard to put into words. And oftentimes, we don't consider that the difficulty we're experiencing raises a certain set of questions in our hearts. And the question that I think is being raised in many people's hearts right now, specifically, is what do we believe? And how deeply do we believe it? This is important. This is the question that's been raised up in our hearts, whether we know it or not. It's what do I actually believe and how deeply do I believe it? Why? Because what I believe will determine how I respond to circumstances. What I believe will determine how I react. It'll even determine the way I frame my intellect and my reasoning and my emotions around circumstances. There's a, um, there's a kind of psychology called cognitive behavioral theory. And it talks about human behavior on a, on a certain kind of landscape. And most people would think that actions begin with thoughts. But this is a common misconception. Actually, actions begin with beliefs. It goes like this. It's your beliefs, then your emotions, then your reasonings, then your behaviors. So you believe certain things, and then it creates emotions in you that then guide the way you interpret your circumstances intellectually. And when you allow it to guide your intellectual comprehension of circumstances, it then creates behaviors that affirm the belief you had to begin with. Our beliefs matter. What we believe matters and how deeply we believe it matters. And, and honestly, I mean, Derek kind of set me up so well when he, when he said the quote, I was going to mention it, that when we talk about this as circuit riders, there's a phrase that we constantly use, and it's God can, God does, and God will. Can we say that together? God can, God, can. God, does, God does, and God will. God will. Say it one more time. God can, God, can. God, does, God does, and God will. And there are many areas of life where this truth is applied. We can talk about it in many different dimensions, but there's one specific that I want to dive into tonight. And I'm praying that the Holy Spirit comes in here and preaches my sermon for me. But what I really want to dive into right now as it pertains to your faith, as it pertains to the God can, as it pertains to the God does, and as it pertains to the God will, is your relationship with his presence. Uh, I know this is interesting, but follow me. This is extremely important. I really believe that this is one of the most important areas where faith has to be applied because it affects everything in life. I'm going to reread our scripture again. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us what? Draw near with a true heart and a full assurance of faith. One of the greatest issues of faith in your life is your ability to press into God. Most times we don't attribute faith to be an issue in this area, but there's so much scripture that affirms this. Your beliefs about God will determine your proximity to God. I need you to hear me. What you believe about God will determine your proximity to him. How do I know? Hebrews 11.6 6 says, y'all know it, but without faith. It's impossible to please God. He who comes to God must first believe that he is and that he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What does that mean? God is actually defining pleasing him in this same scripture. We think that pleasing him begins with getting rid of sin. We think that pleasing him begins with having the right political stances. We believe that pleasing him um, begins with performing in front of people. But what I need you to understand is if Hebrews is defining itself correctly, that faith actually begins and pleasing God actually begins with coming to him actually approaching him proximity is a signal and a sign of belief does that make sense 
which means that most of the sin issues in your life, I feel my help coming already. This is big. Most of my sin issues are actually not sin issues. They're distance issues. There's issues of proximity. They're issues of closeness. It's not firstly about the sin. It's about the distance. You you hear what what I'm saying right now? You will only approach God about certain things if you believe rightly about him. That's how you experience sanctification. That's how you experience freedom, deliverance, all that stuff. And we're going to dive into it tonight. But I need you to understand that the issue is the distance. The issue is your proximity and your ability to press into him. And I believe that our generation needs a fresh encounter with the pressing into God. I know that we have nice services and I know we got professional bands and music and lights. But there's something about a press. When you don't have any other recall or, or reserves or you don't have any other options and you You've got to dive deep into a place with God that cannot be serviced by pianos and cannot be serviced by drums and cannot be serviced by bass playing. There's something that happens when you've got to press. But you can only press to the ability that you believe. You can only press to the degree that you believe. Our generation needs to press into God. We need the kind of faith that makes us press. Are you following me? This is extremely important. Why is it it important? I'm going to keep saying it. Y'all know that's one of my favorite phrases. This is extremely important. But why is it important? Because pressing into God is the most important area of your life. It affects every area of your life for three reasons. I want to dive into it from the framework of prayer. We don't talk about prayer enough. Now, I'm I'm not talking about circuit riders. I'm talking about in the body of Christ. But we need to talk about prayer just a little bit more. So if you would just oblige me, I want to deal with the issue of prayer on a deep level. Because you're going to find that your relationship to prayer is your relationship to God. It really is. I know they didn't tell you that. But it's true. I promise you it is. So there's three issues that I want to deal with when it comes to the importance of your prayer life. Are you following me? Here we go. The first one is that prayer accomplishes God's divine will in the earth. Oh, this is so good. First John 5, 14 says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us, which means that a lot of times people are offended at ineffective prayer. It's like having an Xbox, not plugging it in and saying it doesn't work. But most times you don't read the manual and understand how it operates. Then when it doesn't work, you get offended with the person who made it. But the issue is you didn't read the manual. So how you know it don't work? You've got to pray according to his will. He does not guarantee answers that are not in accordance with his desires. Come on, somebody. You've got to find yourself at what God wants. This is big. People get mad at God all the time for not answering stuff that he never promised. Not answering prayers that offend him. We be asking God to help us sin sometimes. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I did it when I was in the world. It's okay. We ask for heavenly assistance in our rebellion, and then we wonder why I didn't. Okay, anyway, here we go. We got to move on. We got to move on. The second issue is not just that prayer um, accomplishes God's divine will, but prayer releases the supernatural power of God. Now, I'm a little bit Pentecostal, so if I get a little crazy on this, just bear with me. But the Bible says in James that Elijah was a man just like you and me, but he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain for three years and six months, which means Elijah's prayer life had the ability to affect the patterns of creation. He was praying for more than just his food. The kind of prayers that Elijah prayed sent hurricanes back. Oh, you miss it. You missed it. Affected natural disasters. There's a kind of prayer that releases power. And a lot of the issue we have is an accusation against the ministry of intercession because we've seen powerless prayer. And so we say prayer doesn't work. It translates to issues in society and people respond like this. I bet you've heard this in some kind of way. We need to stop praying.
check, 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 check. Okay, here we go. What was the last thing I said? Oh, yes. What we say commonly when social issues come up, when political issues come up, even issues in our lives, we say this phrase. You need to stop praying and do something. We tired of all that prayer. You need to do something. As if prayer is an action of passivity. But the reason why you believe that prayer is passive is because the kind of prayer you heard is powerless. It's okay. I can do more for my secret place. Oh, you missed it. I can do more for my secret place than you could ever imagine. This is the reason, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but there's one ministry that Jesus had to elevate to. There's one ministry that Jesus had to ascertain to, and it was not the ruler of the universe. It was high priest, the ministry of continual intercession. The Bible even says in Psalm 2, verse 8, that the father said to Jesus, ask of me and I will give you nations for your inheritance. What does that mean? God is ruling the entire cosmos through intercession. Through prayer. Through prayer. All right, this is the last one. Three reasons why your prayer life is more important than you think, okay? The last one is, I said it a little bit earlier, your prayer life will basically determine virtually everything in your life. Especially if you're a believer. The way you act out your Christianity is determined by your prayer life. It's determined by your seat life. I know that we don't believe this stuff, but this is really, really important. And I, I know a phrase that happens a lot in Christendom as we say stuff, because there's just a lot of accusation against prayer for some reason. It makes sense if, it's so much, if there's so much power associated with it. But one of the things that I hear very often is, is stuff like um, people just pray so much, but then they don't act like Jesus or they don't serve. Or there's people who pray but don't evangelize. Or there's people who pray but don't serve the poor. But what I want to submit to you is that if you can pray for hours and hours and not be moved to action, then maybe you were just talking. Maybe you were having a conversation with yourself because I don't see anywhere in scripture where prayer stops at the altar. Prayer always motivates action. One of our favorite scriptures as circuit writers is Matthew 9:38. But what we don't understand is that it's not first ascending scripture. It's first an intercessory scripture. That's why Jesus says the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray that the Lord of the harvest will hurl forth laborers into his harvest field. Now that gets me excited. But the part of it that gets me really excited is when you turn to Matthew 10. Because the same people that Jesus told to pray that harvesters will be sent forth are the same people that he sent out. Which means that if you're praying right, you'll become the answer. Oh, you missed me. I said it means that if you're praying right, you'll become the answer. If you're praying right, you'll become the answer. God's going to send you, okay? Prayer will actually bring you into the divine will of God. And many of us struggle. This is really, really big. Many of us struggle in our walk with Jesus. And we think it's because we're not reading enough. And we think it's because we're not attending enough church services. But it's actually because of a lack of density in our prayer life. And the reason why I know this is because this, this issue shows up in Jesus' life. Now, again, Jesus was perfect. Jesus was pure. He was holy. He never sinned. But Jesus was coached through his intercession into agreement with the will of God. I'm going to take you somewhere. It's going to break your brain if you follow me. But I'm going to take you to the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus is in the garden dealing with the fact that he's got to go to the cross. And the first hour, he has a three-hour prayer meeting. The first hour, he says, God, I don't want to do this. That's why he said, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, let let thine will be done. Y'all remember that scripture? But the second hour, he says, if this cup cannot pass unless I drink it, let your will be done. The sentence begins to change. And by the time the third hour comes, he don't got no if or maybe or nothing. He has a, the son of man is about to be sent into the hands of sinners, which means he prayed himself into resolve. He prayed himself into agreement. If you're dealing with something that God wants you to do that you don't want to do and you pray it and you still don't want to do it, you might want to stay on the altar a little bit longer. 
because there's a place in prayer where God reveals the true nature of his will and the true nature of his decisions towards you. And if you pray long enough, you'll realize that his will is perfect. And even if it's uncomfortable, it's better for you than what you wanted. Jesus started out the prayer meeting scary, but he ended it ready. It's okay. I'll hit you tomorrow. Here we go. I got to keep moving. Got a lot of things to say. But these kind of prayers have characteristics. These kind of prayers are extremely important. They have characteristics that determine them because not all prayer is created equal. God specifically says that there are certain prayers that he prefers and there are certain prayers that he hears and other ones that he does not. And I wish I had a time to do a whole case study and a training on prayer, but I want to dive into something really important as it pertains to our study. That one of the most important characteristics of a life of prayer is faith. 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 It's that seeking. It's that pressing. It's according to faith. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. Your prayers need faith. You can't pray empty prayers and then expect answers. You need faith. Does that make sense? But a lot of us don't know prayer characterized by faith. Most of us know prayer characterized by its opposite. And I'm going to dive into kind of the systems of this. And it might apply to you, it might not. But the opposite of faith is fear. And I want to dive into this concept. This would have been the name of my sermon if I was, if I was real cool. If you, you know, I have cool titles for sermons and stuff like that. The name of this sermon would have been Scary Prayers. But there's a kind of prayer that's scary. And when you're from the hood, we say scary like it means scared. I don't know why we do it, but we do. You're so scary. Like, that don't make sense. But it just it got adopted over time, okay? <laughs> there are kind of prayers that literally are characterized by fear. And I'm going to break them down to you. And there's a scripture in 1 Timothy. Y'all know it. If you've been to church for more than five years or so, you was in elementary school in the, um, what do they call this? A VBS, vacation Bible school. You was in Sunday school, all that stuff. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. What that tells me is that power, love, and a sound mind are the opposite of fear. Follow me. So if you have a prayer life characterized by fear, then you can flip these three attributes and you'll find the description of your prayer life. Works like this. A characteristic of scary prayers is weak prayers. First one, because power is the opposite of fear. What's the opposite of power? Weakness. So prayers that are scary are weak. They don't have any, you know that, um, it doesn't, it's not about volume. But it's about conviction. There's, no, there's a kind of prayer life that has authority. But prayers that are built out of fear cannot have authority. It won't confront things with true conviction. It won't confront things with true resolve. It'll, it'll just wrestle and vacillate. Does that make sense? Now, what was the second one? Love. Which means scary prayers are characterized by selfish ambition, being uncaring or hateful. And I've seen, y'all, listen. Listen. There are prayer lives that are consumed with ourselves. There are prayer lives that are not really caring about people, are not loving the people, that they're really just consumed with our needs. And if, and this is real life for some people, if things don't benefit us, we will pray against what's best for others so that it benefits us. This is a real thing. It's not, it's not no judgment, but this is stuff we need to be conscious of so that we can walk into the fullness of what God has. Does that make sense? Now, the last one is one that I really want to make sure we understand because this is, this is going to help somebody. A sound mind was the third characteristic, right? Which means a prayer life characterized by fear is confused and undisciplined. Because when the Bible says a sound mind, one of the translations is self-control or discipline. Which means confusion and indiscipline will characterize your prayer life. Which means a prayer life characterized by fear is the kind that can't get up at the same time every morning. God asked you to get up at five, but my alarm, I just, I just don't know why I don't hear it. 
It's real life. It's okay. Consistency and discipline is the fruit of faith. Why? Because you believe he's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Does that make sense? So your discipline shows me what you believe. Okay? Now, why is this important? I can give a lot of revelation. But fear, I would say, is one of the principal characteristics of the attack on this generation. And this is why it's so important. This generation has been really being attacked by fear. I don't mean to stir up emotions, but anyone who's seen the news as of late, who's seen any level of updates, knows that fear and anxiety is running rampant. There's so much pain associated with fear that we feel like we can't conquer. Does that make sense? All of us know someone or know someone who knows someone who's affected by deep torment as it pertains to fear. And what I really believe is that it shows up in so many ways. For some, it shows up in the tragedy of depression and suicide. For some people, it shows up in anxiety that just is, is immeasurable. For some people, it shows up in building a life on the paper mache rock called pleasing people. It's a life of fear. Everything's built on how people see me. Everything's built on how people know me. Everything's built on how I can remain relevant or influential, right? It's a life of fear. And this is extremely important because when we know this, we sit with it, but we don't always understand why we're so afraid. We don't always understand why fear characterizes our lives so often. But I want to dive into something because I believe, right, we're talking about faith, that everything you're afraid of reveals what you believe. But the issue is we think it just goes to what we believe about God. But I really believe most of our fears are associated with what we believe about us. Especially when it comes down to our prayer life. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Most of us, well, some people it might not be the case, but most of us don't struggle to believe all the time that God can do certain things. It's that can he do it for me? Or does he want to? Does he care enough? Is he invested enough? The concept of his ability makes sense to us, right? But oftentimes we don't apply it to our real life because of what we believe is wrong with us. The things that wouldn't motivate God to respond. The things that would motivate God to ignore us or not answer us. Does that make sense? How many know what it's like to feel like it's a waste of time to pray? Because God don't hear me. God don't want to talk to me. Look what I did earlier. Look what I did two minutes ago. Look what I did 30 minutes ago. God don't want to talk to me. God doesn't have any interest in conversation with me. He wouldn't answer my prayers. I got to get right first. I got to get things together first. I got to be holy for 3.5 weeks. And then I get back to the place of spiritual authority where God actually cares what I have to say. These are all real realities that we live under. And they really, I believe they choke out the power of our prayer. This is really important because I believe God wants to do something important in our generation. He wants to do something that we have not always necessarily characterized our generation by because our generation has competing lovers and has competing advances and has competing, competing directions. But I believe this is the generation that seeks his face. It's what Psalm 24 begins to talk about, the generation of seekers. And I believe God wants to reveal and restore the seek to a generation. But he's got to break fear off to do it. Does that make sense? And there's a reality that breaks fear off, okay? And this is something I'm recently discovering in my own life, and it's truly delivering me. So I hope it does you a solid tonight. Now, I'm a student of deliverance. I love studying deliverance. If anybody knows, if you talk to me for long enough, it's probably going to come up. But there's a level of deliverance that I never even considered until more recently. And it's attributed to certain revelations of Jesus. I believe every breakthrough is attributed to revelations of Jesus. But there's one that I believe is going to transform a generation. Are you ready for it? It's the body and the blood. You missed your cue. It's okay. You'll get it back. It's the body and the blood. The body and the blood of Jesus has the power to truly deliver you. To actually break you out of every realm of fear that keeps you out of proximity, that keeps you in the distance, that keeps you trying to do life on your own, that keeps you trying to figure out problems without consulting the Lord. 
that keeps you building and building according to your own strength and exhausting yourself and feeling like a disappointment. It's the body and the blood. And this scripture reveals it to us. So I'm going to read it again because I want it to get deep in your system. Hebrews 10, 19 to 22. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest of holies by the what? blood of Jesus verse 20 by a new and living way which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh or his body and having a high priest over the house of God let us draw near which means we press in to the degree we have a revelation of his body and his blood the reason you're distant is because you haven't discerned the body see if I was a preacher I would preach like Paul preached about communion and how he talked about the kind of communion that's dangerous, the kind of communion that invites calamity into your life, and the kind of communion that messes you up. You, I know y'all been eating them crackers and drinking that grape juice and everything's been fine for you, but there's a kind of communion that starts to disturb your life, and it's the kind where you don't discern his body. The kind where you don't discern his blood. We thought it was, how many was in church and you was trying to think of every sin that you could think of to repent for before you took that that, um, bread and you took that wine or grape juice or whatever your church was into? The issue was never about you trying to recount everything you ever did wrong. The issue was you didn't discern the power. You didn't discern the gravity and the supernatural nature of what Jesus did with his body and his blood and it changes the entire trajectory of the conversation so I want to dive into it for you guys tonight on two ends okay now what this scripture says to us and this is going to honestly wrap pretty quick because I feel more of activation tonight more than anything what this scripture tells us is that the blood grants us something and what it grants us oftentimes we think what it grants us firstly is access yes it grants us access but what the scripture says is having boldness to enter the most holy place by the blood, which means the blood actually doesn't just grant you access, it grants you boldness. This is so good to me because when I I think about the way I prayed for so long, I prayed like I had to apologize for standing in the throne room. I had to pray like I truly didn't have a ticket in. Like this was a VIP pass only thing and I somehow snuck in here so I better be careful what I say and I better be careful what I ask for. This is big. I'm I'm telling you. But when I realized what the Bible says about the blood of Jesus, this is one of the scriptures. I'm going to read this in Hebrews again. Y'all should study Hebrews if you got some time. It says Hebrews 9, starting at verse 11, but Christ came as a high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is not of this creation not with the blood of goats and calves but of his own blood he entered the most holy place once and for all having obtained eternal redemption and this is where it gets good for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies come on pay attention for the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God what does that mean that there's something in the DNA of the blood of Jesus that removes everything that is wrong with you. Every disqualifier, everything that will make it easy for God to say, I don't hear you. By the blood, it's washed away. In fact, the Bible says that if you confess, this is big, he is faithful and just to forgive you, but not just forgive you. We preach that part, but cleanse you of all unrighteousness which means the second you confess your sin it is as if not just you didn't sin that time it's as if you never sinned at all which means you stand in God's presence fully holy as he is holy now there's a difference in the way you ask for things if you feel like you have a right to be there 
If you feel like you don't have a right to stand in there, you don't ask. If you at a buffet, y'all know y'all ever been to one of them fancy dinners um, with, with people who got a lot of money. And, and I've been to a couple in my life. And there were some times where I felt like I, I didn't qualify to be there. And so while uh, people would ask me if I wanted salmon, I was settling for the Cheddar Bay biscuits. And I was just sitting in the corner drinking water and drinking my Sprite when there's a whole platter that I have access to. But my issue wasn't my access. My issue was my boldness. Because I believed that I did not have a right. I believed that I was accepted more than I was wanted. <laughs> Come on. We going somewhere. But the blood of Jesus, if you really understand it, it takes away everything from you that makes you not desirable to God. God hates sin. Don't get it twisted. But the blood of Jesus takes away sin, removes it forever, which means that when God sees you, all he sees is the stuff about you that motivated him to create you to begin with, that motivated him to love you and to even spill his blood for you. That's all he sees. He doesn't see what's wrong with you. Does that make sense? This is extremely important. You have a right. You're not an intruder. You are not an intruder in the throne room. Can somebody say that? I am not. Come on, say it again. I am not an intruder in the throne room. You're not catching it. I want you to say it one more time. I am not an intruder in the throne room. I'm not talking about entitlement. I'm not talking about pride. I'm talking about knowing that God has made you his righteousness. Does that make sense? Now, the holies of holies represents this. I'm yeah, I know I like, to, I, I like to get creative with my words. I heard the Holy Spirit say something to y'all, so follow me. And if y'all like to get a little ratchet like me, just go with me, okay? <laughs> now, when I was studying, Nick brought this up to me. You think about the Holy of Holies, it talks about the presence of God. Now, when you look in the Hebrew language, presence translates to a lot of things. But one of the things that presence translates to is face. Which means when you stand in God's presence, you stand and look before his face. And when we hide from God's presence, we're hiding from his face. We're hiding from looks of shame. We're hiding from guilt. We're hiding from the belief that he's mad at us, that he doesn't want to deal with us. Does that make sense? But the blood of Jesus invites his face. The Bible says that he smiles. His countenance shines upon us. And so I felt the Holy Spirit saying something to some of y'all in here. You know when people like to fight and say, hear somebody talking about them in another room. They can't see them. They can't interact with them. What do people say to instigate the next level of activity? Say it to my face. I bet you won't say it to my face. I hear Jesus saying to some of y'all in this room, say it to my face you've got access but you need boldness I don't want to hear no more scary prayers I did something for you that you cannot imagine say it to my face baby girl say it to my face baby boy Now, I know the scripture that some of y'all referencing in here. It's in Exodus where God says, no man shall see my face and what? Live. But ain't that the point? <laughs> ain't that the point? Galatians says, I have been crucified. <laughs> Which means that's the whole point. I'm not trying to live no way. That's the point. I'm crucified, so I've got a right. I've got a right to look him eye to eye. I've got a right to stand in his presence with boldness and not have to look away because I'm afraid of what he might say. He said, say it to my face. Whatever you've got to ask for, say it to his face. Whatever you want to dream for, say it to his face. Because he ain't no punk. So you don't have to be. Go to his presence boldly. Okay, all right. It'll take some time. It's fine. Here we go. We're going to the next point. We talked about the blood. Now let's talk about the body. 
what this scripture says is that the body presents a new and living way, which means that the blood presents access and boldness. What the body does is it brings a pathway into his presence. Does that make sense? And it specifically likens his flesh to what? A veil. Which means when the Bible talks about him tearing the veil, it was not just the physical veil in the temple. The veil was his actual flesh. Now, what does the veil in the temple reveal? The glory of God. When it breaks open, it reveals the glory of God. If that logic holds up, that when Jesus' body was torn, there was something about the nature and the character of God that could not be seen until he was bruised, that could not be seen until he was ripped limb from limb, uh, that could not be seen until they said they could count all of his bones. Now I have proof of this because the Bible says no greater love than this. Lindy referenced it earlier. I'll tell you a personal story. I went through a season maybe a year or so ago with my life with Jesus where it felt like everybody was getting the answers I needed. People I was mentoring, people I was pouring into, people that I was serving. It felt like God skipped over me to give them exactly what I asked for. And my heart started to get frustrated and more frustrated and more frustrated and more frustrated until this came out of my mouth. God, you don't really love me. I know you don't really love me. In fact... You're enjoying this, aren't you? Accusations that were in the midst of my heart. And you know what God said? He didn't say, oh, poor Jonathan. Oh, I'm so sorry you're struggling in this way. He did not say that to me. You want to know what he said? No greater love than this. You cannot, you are not qualified to compare my love for you with anyone else when you've gotten the greatest kind of love that anyone can give. You got my body. You literally got my flesh. Does that make sense? And when that thing got to be real to me, it changed my entire orientation toward God. It changed my entire orientation toward prayer. It changed my entire orientation toward his presence and his promise. Does that make sense to you? You have a pathway to his promise, and it's his body. It's the revelation of his physical suffering for you. It gives you an understanding of how deeply he desires you and how motivated he is to move on your behalf. You've got a roadmap. Now, Genesis 3, Adam and Eve tripping. Went apple picking. Or I was being, I was being ignorant when I was preparing my sermon, and I wrote down that they ate the most expensive acai bowl ever. <laughs> and yeah, you caught it. And when they did this, they got kicked out of the garden, right? And it said something that there was an angel who was blocking the way to the tree of life, right? Does anybody know the story? Except it doesn't say it was blocking the way. It says it was guarding the way or keeping the way, which means that God sent angelic and heavenly reinforces to make sure mankind always had a way back. Always had a way back, that they would never get too far and that nothing else could intrude. Does that make sense? God's been protecting your weight into his presence since before Jesus even came on the earth. He's been protecting the way back. He's been protecting the way back. You are never too far. You're never too broken. You've never messed up too much that you can't rush into his presence. Does that make sense? You see how this starts to change your orientation when you think about prayer? Because there's a lot of you in here who have real needs, right? You have real needs. And for some of you, you stopped asking God to answer. I don't know if it started in 2020 or 2021, or whatever it was, but you stopped asking God to truly answer you. For some, you ask God, but you only ask him for things that are in, within the realm of disappointment-proof prayer. The kind of stuff that, you, that doesn't take any level of risk, that the kind of stuff that is not dangerous at all, the kind of stuff that will protect what little faith you have left. And then there are some of you who just don't ask at all, who just do your own thing, who just move as you go, and there's no judgment for anybody in this room. But I'm just saying, like, 
what could you possibly be missing out on? What could possibly be available to you that you haven't been able to experience, that you haven't been able to press into because you believe wrongly about God? And maybe the key to believing rightly about him is not beating yourself up for not showing up to church every Sunday, for not beating yourself up for that sin that you keep committing over and over and over again. Maybe it's taking a seat, breaking the bread, and pouring the wine. The Bible calls it communion, fellowship, allowing the revelation of the body and the blood of Jesus to hit your heart. And the key to this is this, and this is where I'm starting to wrap this thing up. The key is that the most supernatural thing that Jesus could ever do was save you. I want you to follow this. This is extremely important. We're talking about faith, okay? The most supernatural thing you, God could ever do for you is save you. Do you understand, like, what I just said? That everything you've ever done wrong and everything that every person has ever done wrong since the beginning of time has been taken care of because of his body and because of his blood. That you can literally stand before God as though you are Jesus himself. Because of his body and because of his blood. Now, if this is true, do you think that God is pressed about a parking ticket? No, 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 I'm serious. This is really, really important. Do you think that God is intimidated by the state of your mind? Do you believe that your circumstances are too difficult for him. I'm telling you, if you look this thing, if you look the cross, if you look the body and the blood in the face long enough, it's hard to believe that your circumstance is too hard for him. It's hard to believe that what you're dealing with and what you're going through is outside of his purview. And what the biggest deception that the enemy has released on this generation is to get them to look at themselves instead of looking at the cross. It's getting them to look at their circumstances instead of looking at the cross. It's getting them to look at their situations and get, not getting them to look at the cross. Because when you see the cross, you see that nothing's impossible. Because if I can be redeemed, and if they can be redeemed, and if he can be redeemed, and if she can be redeemed, that's much easier than healing. It's much easier than restoration. I need you to hear what I'm saying. And the reason I know it, this is really, really important because this is going to help somebody tonight. This is big. There's a scripture in Romans 8. It says, Romans 8, 32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Now, this is important for you because the cross is the guarantee of every answered prayer. You have a guarantee. It's in scripture. And if scripture is 100% correct, then there's nothing God wants to withhold from you. Nothing. And the Bible also says nothing shall be impossible for you. But how is this? Through the power of the cross. Now, I know we have our three God blanks when we talk about faith. But I want to add a fourth. We don't have to add it to the, to the mantra. It's just for the purposes of the sermon. I have a fourth. And it's connected to each one. And this is what I want you to do. Like I said, I'm Pentecostal. So I want you all to be Pentecostal with me if you feel it, okay? It's not just God can. It's not just God does. It's not just God will. It's God did. In fact, God can because he did. God does, or you missed it, because he did. And God will because he did I need you to do me a favor and turn to your neighbor if you can find that and say God can because he did God does because he did and God will because he did I need somebody all across this room to make some noise because he did he's not withholding anything from me put his body and his blood on the line, which means that anything that I could ask him is easy for him. God can because he did. God will because he did. God does because he did. 
it's all because of what he already did. And a lot of times when you think about faith, you think about the future. But sometimes you've got to take a blast from the past and start looking back about 2,000 years ago and looking at what he did. Because what he did is a trajectory marker for what he's about to do. In fact, the Bible says that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, which means that everything he will ever do, he already did. Everything's been accomplished in the man. Everything's been accomplished in his sacrifice. Everything has been accomplished in the bruises and the stripes on his back. So this is what I want you to do because I feel God wanting to rumble and shake some people out of scary prayer. I feel like he wants to break people out of a lifestyle that lacks the press. He wants people to pray bold again. He wants people to pray dangerous prayers again. He doesn't want you to accept these circumstances like this is all he has for you. He does not want you to accept this level of proximity to him. You can know him better than you know him. You can be more healed than you are. You can be more free than you are. You can know him on a deeper level. You can have a better marriage than you do. You can have a better relationship with your parents than you do. You can have better grades than you do. There's everything that is available and possible to you to the degree of your press to the proximity to God. What does that mean? Because God's all around us. Your proximity is your revelation. When you see him rightly, he's closer than your skin. So this is what we're going to do. This is my entire sermon. It wasn't as long and as polished and, and cool as the last few. But I feel like we're about to do something really powerful that's going to change something in your life. So if you would so oblige me, I need everybody in this room to stand up. I don't want the band to come up yet. They're going to come up in just a few. But how many feel like you've been praying scary prayers? I want you to be honest. It's okay. On whatever level. Because fear-based prayer looks different for different people. Sometimes fear shows up in the limits of what you ask God for. And limits are subjected to seasons. For some people, faith for deliverance is their limit for their season. And then other people, faith for a city's transformation is their limit. But everybody has a limit. And once you hit that limit, you hit the zone of fear. And I feel like God wants to break through that zone tonight, okay? So this is what I want you to do. I want everybody to close their eyes because we're about to pray. And we're going to pray like we know God hears us and like he wants to answer. We're going to press in like he's already here and he's available to us, okay? So what I want you to do is picture him. I want you to picture him leaving Gethsemane with the chains wrapped around his arms, being dragged through the streets. I want you to picture him being accused of crimes he did not commit. I want you to picture him being spat on in his face. I want you to picture him being beat up and tossed around by people that he created, using hands that he fashioned and formed. And I want you to picture him walking up Pilate's um, stage and being prosecuted for crimes he did not commit. A false trial, an unjust trial. I want you to hear the crucify hymns. I want you to hear the cries. I want you to hear the cries. Don't reject it. I want it to get really, really real to you. I want you to see every step from that place up the mountain called Golgotha, the mount called Calvary. I need you to picture it. I need you to picture the stuff they were throwing at him. I need you to picture the whippings and the lashings. The Bible literally says he was beaten so badly that he was unrecognizable as a person. I want you to picture this. This is what he did for you. This is the point of access you have. I want you to picture him getting those nails in his hands. I want you to picture the nails in his feet. I want to picture the groanings. Picture the groanings, the agony. Picture the mocking. If he really is the son of God, why don't he come down? Show us what he's really made of. I want you to picture it. I want you to picture him hanging high and his lungs collapsing on the inside of him. Every breath he tries to take, he prays, forgive them for they know not what they do. I want you to picture it. Sit with it. Live with it. Now, I want you to think about that as you ask him. Okay? And I want you to think about that as your access point. I want you to think about that as the reason why you don't have to be afraid to pray crazy prayers. Because if he did that for you, what won't he do? If he did that for you, what won't he do? What is he afraid of? What intimidates him? 
there's nothing greater than shedding his own blood. So this is what we're about to do. Raise your hand if there's something you characterize in your life as an impossible situation. It could be your own breakthrough. There might be an area of sin in your life you feel like you can't get free from. It might be a family member you believe is not going to get saved. It might be financial breakthrough that you need. Any area where you feel like there might be an impossibility. And, and sometimes we don't call it impossibility because we're religious. And so we know it would be wrong to say God can't do something. But in our hearts, we really don't expect him to. So if you have an area where you don't believe God's interested, you have an area he does, you don't believe he cares, with that picture in your mind, I want you to begin to pray, okay? On the count of three, we're all going to pray together, but we're going to pray from the body and the blood, which means we're going to begin not just asking, we're going to thank him for what he's already done. And from that place, we're going to ask boldly, okay? So wherever you are, I just want you to start lifting thanksgiving to the Lamb of God. Come on. Thank him for his body. Thank him for his blood. Thank him for what he sacrificed for you. Thank him for what he gave for you. Oh, thank him for the suffering he attributed to himself that nobody had to ask him to do. He did it on his own volition. He did it on his own accord. We thank you, Jesus, for your blood. We thank you for your body. We thank you that you will pour it out for our behalf. We thank you that we were not too wretched, that your arm could not stretch out and save us. We thank you, Lord God, that you saw us fit to redeem by the power of your blood, Lord God. We thank you that your body that was bruised for us, we thank you for your blood that was shed for us. We thank you for every measure of, of brokenness that you endured. We thank you for every mockery that you endure. We thank you for every spit in your face that you endure and that you did it for us. We thank you, Lord God, that you saw us worthy of that level of sacrifice. You saw us worthy of that level of display of love, and it shows your glory, and it shows your intention toward us. And so we thank you. Come on. Thank him. Thank him. Just for a minute. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. We thank you, Lord God. Just get, get lost in it for just a minute. Sometimes we, we leave this place a little too early. Early. I want you to sit in it. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did. Thank you, Lord God, that there's no greater love. I thank you that, that, that I don't know anyone else who would do something that crazy for me. I don't know anyone else who would endure that level of suffering. I don't know anyone else who would endure that level of pain for me, even though I rejected you, even though I've resisted you, even though I made distance with you. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, keep praying, keep praying. Keep praying, keep praying. Thank you. Thank you. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Thank him. Okay. So this is what we're about to do. Now we're going to pray. We're going to do them pretty quick. The band can start coming up now. This is what I want us to do. Like I said, we're not going to pray cute. All right? That doesn't mean you got to be loud. I want you to be decided. I want you to pray with conviction. And I want you to pray like God hears you, Okay? We're going to pray as a chorus, okay? Just as a community, we're going to have a big old prayer meeting. And it ain't even greenhouse. Wow, look at that. That's amazing. Here we go. Does everybody have their thing in their mind that they want to pray for? Okay, let's go for it. On the count of three, I want you to lift your voice like you believe God wants to answer. And he's about to, okay? Ready? One, two, three, go. Come on. Come on, I want you to lift your voice. I want you to press into him just a little bit. Press into him. Come on, you saw what he did for you. You perceived it, you discerned it. Now, if he did that for you, he'll do this. This doesn't scare him. This doesn't intimidate him. Come on, press. Come on, press. Come on, press. Yeah, yeah. Come on. Some of y'all, oh. Some of us might need to repent for disappointment for limiting God, for putting limits on what he can do, for putting limits on what he cares to do, what he wants to do. But let's press. God, I'm asking you right now to save my brother. God, I'm asking you to redeem my sister. God, I'm asking you right now to break the stronghold of addiction off of my life. I'm asking you to bring me into a realm of your presence where else is incomparable. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're about to move in my finances. Come on. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you're about to move in my family, that the, you're going to redeem our family relationships. Come on. Let's pray. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord God, for what you've intended even from before the, the times began. We thank you, Lord God, that you have every intention on keeping your word. Come on. Pray, y'all. Let's go. Just for a little bit longer. Who Pray. Thank you, Jesus. We just declare right now 
that whatever limits we placed on you, we break them off. We break them off and we press into you. We press into you. We press into you and we ask you with boldness. We come boldly before you. We come boldly before you. Oh, for some people, it's believing that your generation can be suicide free. Come on, let's pray. Let's pray. There's some stuff that these headlines have been making you believe is impossible. There's some stuff that what's been happening in politics has been making you believe is impossible. But I want you to pray like Jesus wants to answer. Come on. Jesus, we thank you that you hold all power in your hands and that you're not withholding anything from us. So right now, God, we ask you for the big thing. We ask you for the hard thing. We ask you for the difficult thing. And we do it because we know you can. We do it because we know what you're doing already. And we know what you will do. So we pray, come on, come on, pray. Just for a little bit longer. Come on, pray, just for a little bit longer. We declare the word of the Lord that with man, it might be impossible. With man, this circumstance may be irreversible. But with God, all things are possible. Come on. With God, all things are possible. And so right now, God, we press into you. We press into you. We press into you. We break the limits off of you. Come on. We break the limits off of you. I know you can redeem me. I know you can change me. I know you can fix my heart. Come on, I press in. Some of you might feel led to come to the altar. You can just start coming to the altar. You can just start coming to the altar. This is a time to pray. We're going to pray for just a little bit longer. Lord, I believe you. I believe you. I repent for not believing you. I repent for not believing you. I repent not for, a, not for acting out in sin, but having an internal measure of unbelief. Putting limits on you. Come on, pray. Okay. Keep praying just for a little bit. This is what we're about to do. I want the, the, the band to sing for a little bit. I felt very strongly as to close this night that we were supposed to turn this room into a big prayer meeting. And so as we're singing, I want you to sing as intercession. I don't know what they're going to sing, but I want you to sing as intercession. What does that mean? I want you to sing not just as a request, but as an act of faith believing that God is truly who he says he is. And for some people, you might have to repent saying, I put limits on you. I limited you to my circumstances. I limited you to my disappointments, but I, I know who you are. I'm starting to see it through the cross. I'm starting to see it through the body. I'm starting to see it through the blood. So I'm gonna let them sing for a bit. And this is what I want us to do. I'm gonna come back in just a second and I want us to pray together a couple of things out loud, okay? But I want us to do this over our circumstance. And then we're going to press in for personal breakthrough. And then we're going to press in for breakthrough for our friends and our family, okay? Just for a little bit, okay? All right. You guys got it. I'm 
exalt the slain lamb of God. As we step into this place, we're going to pray. It's going to be very quick to close it out. But I want us to exalt the lamb of God in this place tonight. Can we do that? Can we exalt the lamb? from his rightful place it changes the way you pray come on can we stay on that worthy is the lamb for just a minute worthy is the lamb. come on sing it out sing worthy is the lamb. yeah yeah right there right there right there worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb.
two or three one-minute prayer rumbles, okay? And we're closing tonight. The first one is for what you just brought to the Lord personally. I want you to declare in faith that the blood prevails over your circumstance. In your own words, that slain lamb is exalted over whatever it is you brought on this altar, okay? So real quick on the count of three, I just want you to declare from faith, from joy, from victory, that the lamb prevails, that the blood prevails. Come on, let's go. One, two, three, go. Come on, we declare the blood prevails. We declare there's nothing that's a match for the blood of Jesus, that you've accomplished everything on the cross. Oh, and we thank you, Lord God, that the body and the blood prevails over every circumstance, prevails over every impossible situation. Oh God, we thank you that you're about to do something crazy beyond our wildest dreams, beyond our wildest imaginations. Come on, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Come on, keep praying. Come on, keep praying, keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying for victory. Keep praying for victory. It's already done. It's already done. The healing you need, it's already done. The breakthrough you need, it's already done. It's already done. It's already done. Come on. Come on, it's already done. Hey, hey, come on. I feel faith rising. I feel faith rising. I feel faith rising. Nothing is impossible for the one who was dead and is now alive, who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Come on. Okay, we're about to do the second one. The second one is for our friends, for our family, and for our community. There's people who are not in this room who need our intercession. And what God's doing in you, we want to extend to them, okay, real quick. So if you've got a friend or a family member who needs breakthrough, who needs salvation, who needs deliverance, I want real quick for on the count of three for everybody to lift them up to the Lord. And I want you to pray like the blood prevails, okay? Declare the victory of the blood over their circumstance. Ready? One, two, three, go. We declare the blood of Jesus for the salvation of our family members, for the breakthrough in their finances, for our friends, God, for every circumstance and every situation that they have that feels impossible. We declare the blood prevails. Who? Oh, we declare the blood prevails. In Jesus' name, Lamb of God, you are worthy and you are seated high. You are worthy and you are seated high. And so we intercede on their behalf through the victory of the blood. Come on, right here. We intercede for our friend who's in depression. We intercede for our friend who told us that they're suicidal. We intercede for our family members who feel too broken to come to God. And we say the blood prevails. We say the blood prevails. We say the blood prevails. Come on, two more seconds, just break. All right, this is the last one I felt. I felt to pray for a victory of the blood over this nation, specifically regarding youth and young adults, because there's been an attack on us in this recent season like I've never seen before. But I want us to pray like the blood is about to change the story. Just real quick to close this thing out. I want to pray for our nation that young people would start experiencing the blood and the body of Jesus like never before and it would change everything. Can we do that? Ready? I want you to get a little crazy. I know we circuit riders, so we get crazy, okay? So on the count of three, I want you to go wild in intercession for your generation. Can we do that? Can we do that? All right, let's do it. One, two, three, go. In Jesus' name, we declare the victory of the blood over our generation. We declare the victory of the blood, the victory of the body of Jesus. And we say the cross will be revealed. We say the cross will be revealed. We say that, oh, statistics are shifting. Anxiety is breaking. Depression's breaking by the power of the blood of Jesus. Suicide is breaking. Oh, suicide is breaking. Come on, right there. Suicide is breaking. Gen Z will be suicide free. We declare life, life in 
the blood, life in the blood. Depression is broken, fear is broken, anxiety is broken. Every loss of identity is broken. The blood prevails, the blood prevails, the blood prevails, come on. The blood prevails, come on. I said the blood prevails. Who are you, great mountain? That you cannot bow low, come on. Right there. Jesus has never lost a battle. Jesus has never lost a battle because he embarrassed principalities and made an open show of them on the cross. Every victory belongs to Jesus. All right. We're gonna close the night on this. I just want us to lift up a shout of victory. All right, and then I, I'm, Derek gonna tell me if we have some announcements and we're gonna close, okay? On the count of three, do you believe God heard you in this room? Do you believe that God heard you? All right. Well, we're going to shout like it's done. Shout in celebration that our prayers are heard in heaven. You ready? All right. Don't play cute. All right. I know y'all get wild. This is what we do. You ready? All right. Let's go. One, two, three. Shout. Come on. Come on. Shout because it's been accomplished. I said shout because it's been accomplished. You don't serve a dead God. You don't serve a God that doesn't hear, but he hears and he answers. And every promise of God is yes and amen, 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 amen. Come on, clap your hands for Jesus all across the world. told me to close the night. Do we have any like announcements or anything like that? No? Okay, well, uh, if we do, I'm sorry if I forgot. Oh, greenhouse tomorrow, what time? 8.30 or 8? 8? 8 o'clock. Okay, we'll be back here tomorrow at 8 o'clock, right? 8.30? See? 8.30. That's the final answer. Um, okay, for those of you guys who are going to be with us tomorrow, we'll see you then. For the rest of you, we love you. God bless you. Enjoy your Monday night, okay?